Good evening. Thank you so much. We are here tonight to compliment Ken Burns' two-part four-hour series, The American Buffalo. Congratulations, Ken and Roz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premiering on Rocky Mountain PBS October 16th and 17th and streaming. Tonight, in partnership with PBS, we are graced by the presence of Roz and Ken. We are so appreciative that you're here to join us in Denver tonight. Thank you. Rosalind Lapierre is in the film. Roz is of the Blackfeet tribe of Montana and Matee. They work within indigenous communities, including to revitalize traditional knowledge of ecology, to address climate crisis and environmental justice, and to support public policy toward indigenous languages, among many other endeavors and focus areas. And filmmaker Ken Burns joins us, who is a ubiquitous household name, and as I've heard all day today, needs no introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Ken has been creating thematic and historic documentaries for decades. He has many projects in the works. He's not afraid about being scooped, so we'll probably get around to those at the end. Uh, and we're lucky to be in the seat of this work, as well as your entire catalog of work. So thank you for the breadth of your contributions to history and documentary filmmaking. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I know some of you traveled from near, some of you came from very far. So a round of applause to all of you as well for joining us in belonging. Thank you. My name is Kate Perdoni. I am the Engagement Journalism Director at Rocky Mountain PBS. I've been lucky to work at RMPBS for going on nine years. Uh, I live on Hickory Apache ancestral homelands east of the Rio Grande. These are lands that have been warred, removed, stayed, settled, revisited, returned, and created as reservation at one point, then shifted due to revolt and land grants uh, this is the complexity of life in the land on which we live. I am near the easternmost boundary of Deneta, near Cisna Gene, and also homeland of the Ute. And there is no city where I come from in these areas, and here there was no city. Uh, this is Ute and Cheyenne and Arapaho land, as well as many <laughs> other tribes and folks. Yeah, thank you for being here tonight. So in some places, forests were cleared. Um, here, they planted a lot of trees, and really, it's the people and the nature that have been cleared. So I sit here tonight in an acknowledgment of all of the plants and animals and people who were killed in order for myself and all of us to be here. And revealed through this work of Ken's and is an often invisible thread of history of marginalization. The loss of bison to indigenous landscapes defines in part our collective heritage today and deeply, deeply informs our relationship or lack thereof to the natural world. Ken, you mentioned earlier today that you've had this subject in mind for decades. Why did it become important in this time specifically to create this film and to illustrate these connections? Um, you know, I'm not sure there's a specific time. You know, it takes so many years to do it. We found space to be able to say we could give the, the project the attention it needed. And as I was saying before, I'm, I feel lucky that we were blessed with the delay of several decades, so allow us to benefit from scholarship that's taken place for us to be perhaps better as filmmakers and to be able to, to yield uh, interpretation to entirely different um, points of view. It, it was really important for us to do that. And, you know, in storytelling, you don't necessarily want to describe what a reaction in the other should be. The idea of storytelling is to communicate and kind of offload what you've collected, what you've, what you've reduced into a story, and then it, let it go. So I, I think it's an important moment right now, but I say that not as a filmmaker, but as someone now having finished with the film, it's yours now. It's really all of yours, and, and we'll sit back and watch what those reactions may be. We are really in a serious place with our planet, and the buffalo is an extraordinarily important cautionary tale in, in very negative ways and very positive ways. 
And I, I hope that we can, as people come together around protecting the ecosystems necessary to sustain these, what, what do you call them, charismatic fauna? Is that what it is? <laughs> the, the big ones, <laughs> you know. Megafauna. Megafauna, <laughs> you know. And um, I'm, I'm learning all the, the terminology of it. Um, I just remember being a kid and seeing my first buffalo, and just the, I'm the son of an anthropologist, and my bedroom wall had the ubiquitous map of the United States, but there were there were political divisions of the states, but no names. They were all tribes. Mm. So I learned the extraordinary poetry of the the nations that 300 plus nations that occupied what is the political boundaries of the continental United States. It's um, sort of been in my life blood. Uh, but this film really allowed us all, Dayton Duncan, the writer, Julie Dumphy, the co-producer, Juliana Branham, the consulting producer, a Cherokee woman, and uh, others who were deeply involved, including Roz, not just in sitting for an interview, patiently sitting for an interview, but also contributing uh, so much in our understanding of what was going on behind the scenes, advising us. Yeah, Roz, when did you uh, become invited into the project and what became emergent as the most important message to convey throughout this process? Um, so before I answer that question, I want to have a shout out to um, a couple of folks. One is Lucille Echohawk. Yeah. Who... <laughs> So Lucio Echohawk is a longtime leader here in the Denver community, now an elder, and uh, one of the first people who hired me in a job when I graduated from Colorado College. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, so um, I got involved more than two years ago, around two years ago, um, both as an advisor and um, as an interviewee, and then throughout, and so I've never done this kind of thing before, so it was really interesting, eye-opening, I learned a lot, um, and so over the last couple of years, various iterations of kind of looking at the script, looking at the rough cuts, um, meeting with other people who were advisors and then also interviewees and historians. Um, so it was really, really interesting process. Um, uh, again, something I have never done before. And um, I think that one of the things um, that is an important, I guess, message to come out of this is just the idea of um, how we should think about, as Americans, uh, our both complicity in the near extinction of an animal, and then also um, what we can do to try and then bring an animal back from extinction. I think one of the things that I often hear, of course, just FYI, I'm a historian. I'm an environmental historian and a Native American historian. Uh, Oftentimes, one of the things that I hear people say is that, you know, it was Europeans or Euro-Americans who were part of this process. It wasn't. It was Americans. It was us. We did it. And we have to address that complicity of our own story, our own history, and then we have to take that into the future of how we're going to address that. So I think that that's one of the things for me as a takeaway is to constantly remind people that this is really an American story. Um, this story of near extinction and then bringing an animal back. Mm, thank you yeah. for that. I wanted to ask you about the middle of the Venn diagram, sort of between the new world and the old world, sort of, just so to speak, and the, the common denominators that you find bind us through this process. So much of your work, Roz, is directly on the ground, boots on the ground, navigation of ecosystems, real-time understanding and relationship with nature, which is largely a participatory experience. So stewardship of the natural world in a co-creation and friendship mechanism is way different than the value system of commodification of natural resources. So I'm curious, I wonder if you find it hard to translate between the two value systems or what have you found to be the most effective method of communicating between? Yeah, I mean, so one of the, thing, one of the ways that I do that is I teach, right? 
<laughs> so um, I teach primary, so just FYI. So I taught at a tribal college for about 10 years where I taught primarily uh, native students and now I teach uh, in mainstream institution where I teach primarily non-native students. And so I think it's important to teach students um, about these um, stories and, um, and that they um, have an active role in kind of the end of the story, so to speak. Um, and one of the things that has been brought up earlier, but that, um, that uh, we've brought up when we've talked about this film is, and I'll, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, um, <laughs> is that you know this, this film is sort of the beginning of the story, but there's still more of the story to be told in terms of um, how we deal with this particular animal, but not just this animal, but there's other species as well right. um, that we have driven to near extinction. So I'm gonna pass the mic. Well, no, I, I think that's uh, really true, and you almost have to go back and begin to try to imagine what the Great Plains looked like before white Americans started to populate it. That is to say, it was, as many people call it, an American Serengeti filled with sound, filled with flora, filled with fauna, and an incredibly rich thing. Now it is a silent place, a monoculture of planted grasses or wheat or, or, or crop. Most of the animals have left. And what I think the end of the film does to sort of take the baton from what Roz is saying is that it's saying, okay, we've saved this animal, it's a good story. I mean, you cannot make up the fact that the first wildlife refuge is populated with buffalo from the largest city in North America, <laughs> saved by various people, including William D. Hornaday, who likes eugenics and hates Indians. And I mean, it's, you, this is why I wanted to lock the doors and show you the whole thing because it's very, it's, it's so complicated. But, but it's not enough to just save them. The buffalo is, is free of ex, from extinction now. But they are not wild and free yet, and that's the key. Will we be able to have the courage to sustain an effort to create? ecosystems, big, large ecosystems, millions of acres in what is a relatively quickly depopulating plains, depopulating of homo sapiens, and be able to try to restore, and the buffalo will be key to this, that American Serengeti. They brought the buffalo wallows from rubbing around in the dirt, which created pools, which gave disturbed areas a place for certain kind of plants to grow. Other species were there, as Roz is suggesting. You know, the elk lived on the Great Plains, not in the Rocky Mountains. Grizzly bears lived on the Great Plains, not in the Rocky Mountains. Coyotes, wolves, all sorts of things can have the possibility if we create large enough spaces for them to return and for us to begin to put back into balance not just the cultural and spiritual violence that we've done, not just the murder, the greatest murder of animals in the history of the world took place on the Great Plains to, with the buffalo primarily, but also the other species I mentioned, but how we might have a relationship to this story in an ecological way, which is where Roz is so important in our helping us to understand that. Yeah, I was gonna ask and continue, yeah, thank you. In continuation of that disparity of value systems or lived experiences, you know, with the bison illustrating this symbiotic existence for such a long time, everything is calibrated to this. Many people this day and age do not have a point of reference for this intimacy of nature. What is, does this film then become a point of reference? That is a good question. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think one of the things that this film will be a reminder of is that um, you know indigenous people lived with bison 
for thousands of years. Um, indigenous people co-evolved with bison. I mean, one of the stories that's in here is that um, the modern day bison, 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 um, the modern day bison are an animal that existed throughout their entire lifetime with humans, right? They have always lived with humans. They have always co-evolved with humans. And so um, that is a story of, uh, you know, the indigenous people being here for that entire time um, and having that kind of intimate relationship. And I'm hoping that out of this film that people begin to realize that long time period um, that indigenous people were here and it's not just a story of um, the last 200 years. That's really important. And so the key word is resilience, right? You've, you've, you've had this break. It's a break because you've had the absence of this animal central to your culture and your life ways, your, your religion, your creation myths, all of that. But it doesn't mean that it cannot be repaired. It doesn't mean that you can't jump over those two or three generations if you've had 600 generations of experience with this animal and that you might be inspired. You know, Dan O'Brien at the beginning of the second episode is talking about looking into the eye of a buffalo and anybody who has been close to a buffalo, you look into their eyes and they've seen everything. They have seen everything and there's something incredibly powerful about that and about the repatriation that's taking place of buffalo with tribes. In the beginning, I don't, you know, probably know this figure off the top of your head, but the uh, Intertribal Buffalo Council started off in the early 90s with a handful of tribes. And it's now 80 tribes are actively involved in stewardship of buffalo and helping to repatriate buffalo to other tribes that are farther east and west that, that are, whose time away from the buffalo has been even greater. And, and there is our consulting producer, Juliana Branham, has made this beautiful little film that will accompany ours called Homecoming, in which Jason Baldy's uh, from Wyoming has taken buffalo from Colorado and taken them to Wisconsin, to the Menominee, who probably haven't seen buffalo in 250 or 300 years. And the look in their eyes, the kind of recognition between animal and human is powerful. And in that connection is, I think, the key to going forward in this. There's all sorts of other work that has to do, be done. There's work that all of us have to do. But I also think we have to create the conditions that permit this reconnection to take place. And then, you know, as Jermaine White says, when the buffalo are good, the land is good. When the land is good, things are good. It's so important and awesome to recognize that we've known this for longer than we haven't. And if that rut, you know, has been created and we are in that groove, then all the easier to return, right? Um, I'm curious, Ken, how you navigate presenting this experience to an audience that then has to self-reflect? Well, that's the great gift of history. You know, I, I know that we're in this middle of this unbelievable discussion in our country. Unbelievable in that I can't believe that we're actually having it. <laughs> <laughs> About somehow, somehow limiting our history, that somehow people are sensitive, that we don't want people to feel bad about stuff and things like that. I would direct you all to a YouTube thing. It's only a few minutes long by a young woman. Uh, her name is Katerina Metro. She teaches history in Maryland and she was born in Germany. And she basically says, I have been taught the history of my country, which is arguably among the worst histories you could possibly have. And I am not traumatized. I remember what our president, which is largely a ceremonial role in their country, as opposed to the chancellor, prime minister, said, I love my country with a broken heart. You cannot go anywhere in Berlin, other places in Germany, without literally stumbling over cobblestones that remind you particularize in intimate details 
the horror of their history. And you know what? They do their history really well. They're adjusted to it. And she said to me, finally, you know who saved us? You know who instilled our democracy? You know who told us that we had to have an educational system that unblinkingly, unfailingly taught this history? It was you. And the idea that we would now limit that history suggests that our trajectory might actually be more towards how they were than how they are, something we do not want. You know? And it and the and this is inheriting from our previous film on the US and the Holocaust. If you wanted to be in the hippest place on earth in 1932, where everything is happening in music and cinema and architecture and painting and livelihood of discussion, you would do no better than to be in Berlin. And the next year, the next January of the next year, not so much. These things happen so quickly that the vigilance, which has become a cliche that we're supposed to have in defense of liberty, is not only so true, it is, it is absolutely palpable at this moment. Jefferson said in the Declaration, a few sentences beyond the famous one, the second one, he says, all experience has shown that mankind is disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable rather than throw off. I mean, he's saying we are used to being under the authoritarian's yoke. That is the human experience of everyone up until this moment. And at this moment, we're going to try to create something else. Needless to say, all of this is based on the Haudenosaunee of the Iroquois Confederation. This is where the idea of a democracy, a union between states could come. But we'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> But, but that it requires a kind of energy and activity, what we would call citizenship, in order to make sure that the old forms do not reassert themselves. All experience has shown that mankind are disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. No. Something you've said a few times is that we have to understand collectively that the European American perspective is not the only one, that our way of looking at things is not the only way. How did you learn to look at things anew through the creation of this documentary? What did you learn about yourself in the process? First of all, I went to Hampshire College in its second year of existence, and its whole idea, its motto, its Latin motto is non satisfiere, which means to know is not enough. It encourages multiple interdisciplinary perspectives. So our work has always been informed by this idea that you look at things from different points of view all the time. A lot of that is just, as I was suggesting, lip service sometimes. You just say, oh yeah, there's other things, and I, you know, you know what it's like to talk to someone who's absolutely certain they know how you feel when they clearly know nothing of how you feel and don't intend to actually do any of the work necessary to actually know how you feel. This happens in larger areas as well. And so I think as we've grown as filmmakers, we try to include complicated things. Wynton Marcellus said to me once in the jazz series, sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing are true at the same time. And I just felt like, yeah, that's it. That's what it is. And so we have proceeded from the idea that we can complicate things because that's the way they are and we tell them this project in a different way required us to just absolutely drop a lot of the preconceptions, a lot of the sort of basis of you produce from a position of certainty rather than a position of questioning and openness. And I think 
I'm speaking for all of it. Dayton Duncan, who wrote the beautiful script, Julie Dunphy, who is my co-producer, the editors, the consultants. I think all of us felt that somehow we had our molecules rearranged in this in a good way. Very cool. And speaking about holistic approaches. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> An ad lib, very cool. Um, you know, you're talking about interdisciplinary approaches, and Roz, you do, you know, when we're talking about researching your educational history and path was really cool to see how you started in math and science and then physics and botany and religion and this whole sphere, the natural world, the boots on the ground piece, plus history. And today, all of that is reflected in your work with the tribal communities. You are addressing issues that communities find important and creating education and outreach surrounding them. You're exhibiting that community work in and of itself is interdisciplinary. And how does this type of holistic approach support your work and the work with the bison? Yeah, so that's, you know, so I, I mean, I think that this is something that, again, this story will resonate um, on a lot of different levels um, with, with different folks. And um, I think one of the things to continue to um, consider uh, when we look at these kinds of stories is the role of, and I'm going to change the subject a little bit here, but the role of religion and religious practice and why it's so important to certain people and why it's especially important to indigenous people um, and why a particular animal can be um, a sacred uh, animal. And I think that this is something that um, as people uh, watch this talking about different perspectives, um, you're gonna see sort of different perspectives about that um, and why even today um, Americans revere uh, bison in a certain way, maybe not in a religious way, but in a, in a different way. Um, but I think that religion and religious practice is something to con continue to think about as we um, move forward as a country, because, you know, again, indigenous people have been here for thousands of years. And when we look out, um, especially here, kind of in the Rocky Mountain West um, and in the Southwest, kind of everywhere you go is sacred land and landscape. And so it is very difficult um, as development is occurring um, for people to, um, sometimes think about those places as places that have been populated for a very long time, but those places that are um, important and sacred to um, the indigenous people there, including um, the animals that were important to them. As we start um, creating more and more spaces um, for bison to, con to return to live, um, you'll see the connection back between sort of sacred landscape and sacred animals. And one of the things that um, gets addressed in the film, but then also is addressed in discussions, is um, this idea that, you know, bison still are not where they should be, right? Um, and they are primarily in, um, con in confined, um, in small spaces. Um, the Blackfeet tribe, uh, which is my tribe, was the first tribe just maybe about a month ago um, released a small number of bison um, and made them free roaming bison. And they are the first free roaming bison in the United States for over, well over a hundred years. <laughs> so the idea of like, confinement um, and confining bison behind fences, even if they're really, really large fences, you know, large space, it's still behind a fence. And so I, it's, to me, it's really interesting to see um, in the future how these things are going to connect back between, again, kind of sacred land and landscape and sort of um, the why are those places sacred? And oftentimes it's our connection to animals, connection to certain plants, um, and connection to the uh, divine. Can so. I ask a, a, her a question? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Indians were forced onto reservations and, and significantly, obviously, much smaller than their homeland, but they're not insignificant 
pieces of land. But the Dawes Allotment Act further eroded that. I wondered a lot as I was touring Montana in June whether if there hadn't been a Dawes Allotment Act, it would be possible within the entire Blackfeet community or the Lakota Reservation or Wind River to have enough space to have that. But the Dawes Allotment Act was the yes but to every other treaty that was broken, which just said, hey, we're going to do you a really big favor. We're going to give you 125 acres of farmland and 250 acres, believe it or not, of ranch land. Yes, it's all yours. And then we're going to take the rest and open it up for white settlement. And in that is that just the further erosion of tribal lands in the United States. And you wonder what kind of ecosystems we could already be building together, mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. if, if those lands were still intact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Michel Pablo has to sell his herd because of Dawes, and he wants to sell it to the United States' largest private herd in existence and on the Blackfeet Reservation, and he, has to, he sells it to Canada because the U.S. won't pay for it. And, and then they bring other buffalo to where his land was to create a buffalo refuge. And the stray buffaloes that weren't rounded up are outside his, and you'd think they'd be added. No, they were just shot. I mean, yeah. you, you, the stories go on and on. I mean, one thing that you reminded me when you said how much uh, other Americans love the buffalo, maybe not in a religious context, a few years after the return of the buffalo from the Bronx, to the Wichita Mountains, I still can't believe that's true. Um, <laughs> we have, in 1913, an Indian head nickel. On the front is a chief, we know his name, and on the back is a buffalo, we know his name. He was sent to slaughter in the meat passing district of Manhattan after he um, posed for this nickel. That means that we are beginning to romanticize and even fetishize two entities, two primal forces on this continent that we have just spent the last hundred years trying to get rid of. And George Horse Capture Jr. says, I just have to ask this question. Why do you kill the things you love? It's just a profound you know, rearrangement of your molecules to have him just confront you with the absurdity of this, that all of a sudden you spend all this time getting rid of it. And look, it's not the official policy of the United States government to get rid of, 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 of uh, the buffalo, but it is a spoken policy of everyone and everyone knows and it is articulated that if you kill the buffalo, you kill the Indian. And that's how you get rid of that. This is a kind of ethnic cleansing that takes place because you know if you take away this, they cannot live. And this is all on our, all of our, as you say, all Americans' hands. Mm -hmm. I want to just touch on briefly, I know within you know, eons of storytelling that have been passed on, even in four hours, we're touching the surface of so many histories within histories that are available and just to recognize that within these experiences there are non-transferable you know experiences where it is either you know where there is information that is not to be publicized that is not to be shared with the outside world how did you hold space for what cannot be shared in the bigger picture of this film Say, are you... <laughs> you know, it's, first of all, it's a really beautiful question, Kate, and we're grateful for it. Um, there is, well, as you began your introduction, you felt compelled to list various nations that are part of your physical space. And in the film, you hear Kiowa, you hear Cheyenne, you hear Comanche, you hear Blackfeet, you hear this, you hear different, and you begin to disrupt in a positive way the sense of a monolith. That's what we do. We always make the other a them, right? It's always a them. And what I've learned is that there's only us. Mm. 
there's only us and there's no them. Capital U.S. And, and little us, you know. And part of that, strangely enough, is, is sort of removing the monolithic, the tyranny of the monolithic idea of them. Like, when Roz is talking about spiritual experiences, she is not talking about a uniform spiritual experience, right? This is like Methodists and Baptists, <laughs> you know? There can be big disagreements <laughs> between 20 miles, between two groups, and, and more important, many things that are shared in common. And so, you know, Kwana, thankfully, is talking with Jesus, not about him, you know? <laughs> Did you have anything you wanted to add, Roz? Okay. <laughs> About, okay. Um, I'm curious, just in the name of PBS, you know, I grew up in rural areas, and PBS was really one of two uh, television channels that was available to me. Thus, I grew up on your work, was raised on it. And I think about, you know, the kind of responsibility that you have in co-creation with PBS, knowing that your work is so accessible. In many of the places I report and create work, Southern Colorado, the San Luis Valley, it is you go into folks' homes, it's Rocky Mountain PBS is on television because that's what we have access to. We don't have access to internet often. It's rare. What is the responsibility that you carry knowing that your work is so broadly transmitted and received? You know, that's an honor. We're, I have had the privilege for almost 50 years of working with the largest television network in the United States, more affiliates than any other network by far. And it reaches, as you say, almost everybody. Somebody gets a PBS signal, even if they don't have or can't afford cable or, or don't have that access. And that's a really important thing. The thing is, is that as a filmmaker, and I'm speaking now collectively of the people I work with as well, um, we're harder on ourselves than even that. The responsibility begins here. I'm just fortunate enough to have a network is willing to wait 10 and a half years for Vietnam, <laughs> right? Or wait 10 years for the national parks or five and a half for the Civil War. Whatever it, it was, it isn't something about a marketplace demand that you would do it. I, I could, I mean, I'm raising money all the time. It's a pain in the neck. And I could go to places and get the money like that, but they wouldn't give me the time or the space or the ability to have the depth to do it. And only PBS does that, only PBS does that. And that's a great gift. <laughs> So many questions I want to ask. We just have a couple of minutes left. But Roz, we learned in the documentary, as Ken mentioned, about the Intertribal Buffalo Council, which is a 30-year-old organization with 83 member tribes who have reinstated 25,000 buffalo to 65 herds in 20 states, providing for spiritual and ceremonial practice and community. What other, you know, personal or public or other initiatives are you really excited about right now? Oh, well, there's lots, but I'll just, um, I mean, one of the things I'll say is, you know, um, the, really the foundation of indigenous communities is indigenous language. And, and embedded in indigenous language is everything. You know, embedded in indigenous language is our ecological knowledge. Embedded in indigenous language is our religion and religious practice. Embedded in indigenous language is the story of the bison. And so I think that there are a lot of different, um, a lot of different tribal communities are working to revitalize their languages um, in a lot of different ways, either through having immersion schools or having, at, during COVID, I think every indigenous community had some sort of online community um, where we were all on Zoom. And I, I remember be, sitting in one class with um, Blackfeet Community College and there was more than 600 people um, on that Zoom class um, just wanting to sit and talk in the Blackfeet language. So I think that um, indigenous languages is one that if you can support in your local community, wherever that local community is, um, I think that that is a fantastic way to kind of revitalize um, because it is sort of the foundation of any indigenous community. And that's one of, the, one of my um, passion projects that I've always um, worked on. 
Um, I never get paid for these things. So, you know, passion project means it's for free. <laughs> 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 my, real, my real job, my real hat is I'm, I'm a college professor, uh, but that allows me to do lots of other stuff. But no, I think that native languages really are something that, um, that is important to me um, because it is sort of that foundation of every part of indigenous communities. Yeah. Okay, thank you Thanks. so much. And Ken, I know our audience would love to hear a little bit about what you've got in the works these days. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> so after this year, next year is our first non-American topic wow. on Leonardo da Vinci. We've been working on it for several years. It's, it's, it's great. I, I was a little bit anxious in the beginning because it's been, my entire life has been American stories. For a while I was trying to convince myself that he was actually an American or the, <laughs> or the first American because of his independence in this. But he's firmly Italian, but he's great. Um, we have, uh, two years from now, um, probably the most complicated film we'll ever work on, uh, on the American Revolution. It is not your, and it begins with the native voice, is the first voice you hear, um, saying, we think you know how valuable our lands are, and we think you want to take them from us, mm. which is one of the reasons why the revolution happened, probably the principal reason not just representation and taxation and all that sort of stuff. So it's very complicated. There are no pictures or no newsreels, so if you know any photographs from that period, <laughs> please see me afterwards. Um, uh, we're working really, really diligently. We've also, I was working, filming yesterday on a film called Emancipation to Exodus, you know, one of the most misunderstood periods in American history is Reconstruction, which, you know, Churchill said that the Winners write the history, he's dead wrong. Um, the Confederates wrote the history of the Civil War, and the Confederate Army has not disbanded. And um, our, you know, the story from Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind is that a homegrown organization, terrorist organization, like Al Qaeda or ISIS, called the Ku Klux Klan, were the heroes in the post Civil War story. It's not true. And it's important to tell a story, and we just backed it up to the moment of emancipation and ahead to the beginning of the exodus of African Americans, the mass exodus out of the South uh, to the North to seek, as Richard Wright said, the warmth of other suns. Um, we're also working on a film on the history of LBJ and the Great Society, and kind of the reverse engineering of the Vietnam film. And uh, my longtime Co-director Lynn Novick was a project that I was working on, but because of all the other stuff gave to her, I'm serving as executive producer on a history of crime and punishment in the United States. And then we've got a few other projects. <laughs> but, all, but the ones that I just named go to the end of the decade. And so it's just, I mean, I know what I'm supposed to be doing every day uh, for the next... Um, uh, seven years. Wait, no, Dostoevsky is Russian, though. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm gonna, thank you, Denver. Yes. Great to be Thanks here. Thanks for having us.